All right, how are you guys doing? This episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. Now, the Russians have finally cracked another big milestone. I don't say finally, but they've actually cracked another milestone for themselves. They have now passed a uh, confirmed 200,000 men. Yes, 200,000 men casualty-wise. That's actually pretty insane if you guys think about over 7,300, almost 7,400 APVs, 6,000, over 6,100 fuel tanks and or trucks, 3,765 tanks, 3,150 artillery pieces, 2,000, almost 2,800 UAVs, almost 600 MRSs, over 300 planes, almost 300 helicopters. We're about to crack 1,000 cruise missiles, 320 anti-warfares, or excuse me, anti-aircraft warfares, and 410 like special equipment, like just random stuff. Those are the numbers. We haven't talked about these in a while. It's not something I really like to... To harp on daily because it really does not matter. But 200,000 troops, that's quite a bit. That's a lot. That's pretty insane. Now, American troops this last week held a very large exercise inside of Alaska, which is not too uncommon, depending on the size of, of it, of course. I mean, it's a pretty, 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 pretty common to do these kind of drills. Now, the Russian aircrafts decided they were going to, I don't know, kind of, I don't know, poke the bear a little bit. They were intercepted near the Alaskan Air Defense Identification Zone. They, of course, did not enter the airspace entirely here inside of America and or Canada. The crazy thing here is the fact that this usually happens about six times a year. That's what happens. That's pretty much what it is between America and Canada and that, and that kind of area. They, they get intercepted six times a year on average. This is, that is how many times have it happened in, how, in just, just this last week? That's, that it's, it's been 12 times this year alone, in the last three months, 12 times Americans have actually intercepted Russians inside of this airspace in the last three months. That's double the yearly average this couple months. And you know, it also seems like some of the fighters inside of Bakhmut might be a bit mad with the Russian government, but that's just me saying something out loud. И страна из-за таких пидоров, как ты, проиграет войну, нам придется прийти на Красную площадь. И чтобы защитить свой народ, россиян, отъебать тебя и таких, как ты, в жопу. Поэтому, блядь, приезжай к нам сюда, пидор престарелый. Now I feel like we're seeing this bit of a resistance coming from the Wagner group. Now even more so from their owner, their founder. There's a lot going on with that over the last couple of days. There's been a lot of documents that are getting leaked. Just going to throw that one out there. The Wagner chief, the uh, Prigozhin, he offered to give up Russian troop locations inside of Ukraine. This is kind of nuts if you guys think about it. So Prigozhin has been in a little bit of tissy fit. If you guys don't know what the Russian government, he didn't think they're giving them stuff. It just, it's just not very good. He said, that if Ukraine's commanders withdrew their soldiers, their troops, from the area around Bakhmut, he would actually give Kiev information on Russian troop positions. Does, does Prigozhin really actually care about Russian troop positions? No, honestly, he probably doesn't. It, they're not really falling underneath him. He doesn't care. He's a businessman. Uh, Prigozhin also conveyed the proposal to his uh, contacts inside of Ukrainian military's intelligence that, you know what? He's actually maintained a secret communication, by the way. Just going to throw this out there. During the course of the war, that's not uncommon. This happens all the time. Both parties always talk to each other. That does happen. Now, two Ukrainian officials confirmed this is true. He has spoken several times to Ukrainian uh, intelligence over the course of, I don't know, the, the war. It happens. They're known as the HUR. H-U-R. I don't know. HUR. HUR. Anyway, one official actually stated that Prigozhin extended the offer regarding Bakhmut more than once, but Kiev actually rejected these offers because the officials don't actually trust them. Shocker. They don't trust this crazy madman and thought that his proposals actually could have been disingenuous. Shocking. Oh my God, this guy's going to be disingenuous. Who would have thought? He has complained publicly, privately, that Russian Defense Ministry has not given his fighters the ammunition and other resources they actually need to succeed, which is so true. Other leaked documents also reveal that Russian Defense Ministry officials privately are wondering how to respond to Prigozhin, um, the whole criticism of the military's performance. Like, he keeps talking how terrible they've been, and which is very true. I mean, he's not lying. They've been doing a terrible job. Think about it. They have not moved in months. They're fighting street to street. Right now, they're actually losing chunks we're going to talk about around the outer edges of Bakhmut. His demands for more resources, which they have not really, I don't know, they, they don't really care. The, the Russian military, uh, the, I mean, excuse me, the Russian defense ministry does not give, they don't really seem like they really care. The documents also speak to a power struggle between Prigozhin and top officials, including like the actual Russian defense minister himself. 
That's, I mean, what's going to happen? You guys brought a businessman into a war zone, expecting him uh, not to to care about monetary gains. That's all he really cares about. Against against this whole tense backdrop, though, Progression has actually carried out like a, a secret relationship with Ukrainian intelligence that, in addition to these phone calls, includes like in person meetings with the her office. Uh, in an unspecified country inside of Act for Africa, I guess it's we know that he's been through Africa. They've done a lot of stuff in Africa, and the guy we're going to talk about here later on actually loves Prigozhin so much he loves him. And according to one document, Prigozhin actually told a Ukrainian intelligence officer that the Russian military was struggling with ammunition supplies. Okay, well, me sitting here in America, I could have told you that they've been struggling with this. He also advised Ukrainian forces to push forward with an assault on the border of Crimea, which. Of course, we know that's not a chunk of Russia, which is that. I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with that. The report also was referring to the fact that other intelligence officers are noting that Prigozhin was aware of the plummeting morale among his his group, his Wagner forces, and that some of his fighters have actually balked at the order to deploy inside of certain areas of Bakhmut, which I did find out here later on in this episode, that they're not really about it. They don't want to move forward in heavy fire. They don't want to sustain any more casualties. And I know that he's rotating his men out right now. This is this is the truth. We're gonna we're gonna talk about this here later on. I found some more stuff after I, I read through this. This is actually taking me a couple days to actually put this episode together. I know I haven't seen you guys by the way for four or five days. I was gone. It was Mother's Day. I'm back. Willie's gonna be here in four days. He lands in four days, so I guess he takes off in three days from now. He's gonna be here. We're gonna be back to cranking him out every single day. I just want to let you guys know. Now the head of Ukraine's Supreme Court has also been detained inside of Ukraine. This is kind of crazy. By the way, if you guys don't know, yes, Ukraine is extremely corrupt. It really is. Now, he was he was detained uh, allegedly for being involved in a bribery scheme. Ukrainian prosecutors have actually taken into custody the head of the country's highest judicial body. He's like the highest guy. Uh, the rest actually follows this anti-corruption Beru's announcement. They're like doing this big thing. Um, they made through their Telegram, their Facebook channels. They're really like like going after. They're, they're trying, trying to... I don't know if that's going to be... The, it's going to be possible. I don't know if it's going to happen. But they're trying to to taper down all the corruption that's actually going on inside of Ukraine. The investigation itself exposed a bribery scheme involving the court's leadership and the judges. A, this photograph you guys are seeing right now is showing stacks of all this money neatly arranged on a sofa, okay? This is this is really... I mean, why would you even post this photo? Like, oh my God, look, I got a couple... Of, like, this is stupid. What would you do this? Ukraine right now ranks 116th out of the 180 countries on Transparency International co- or, uh, Corruption. That, that's... Pretty terrible. Pretty terrible. Thank God we've been sending a bunch. That's the thing is I'm glad we're not sending. Actually, you know what? I say that and I know we're all sending cash because when I was in Iraq and Afghanistan, we literally had like officers that would come by and they would be having stacks of cash to repay civilians and stuff for, for an ID going off in front of their, their, their store. I don't know. It was just really stupid, but that really panned out really well. Way to go. U.S. taxpayer dollars. It, it is what it is. Now, flavors in full bloom here at HelloFresh. I'm going to say that. It, it, it just kind of gets your mouth watering. If you guys enjoy the taste of spring with chef-crafted recipes featuring a ripe seasonal ingredients delivered right to your guys' door, hey, guess what? HelloFresh does more than just delivering these delicious dinners. Not only can you guys take your pick from 40 weekly recipes, but you guys can actually choose from over 100 items to round out your order from snacks and eating lunches to desserts and pantry necessities. Everything arrives in one box on delivery that you guys choose. Yes, when you guys choose a day, it comes to you. They have this new fast and fresh options that are easy, ready in just 15 minutes or less. No more sourcing through the store or the grocery store scouring, just going around trying to find ingredients to complete your recipe. They make it easy for you guys. They take away all the hassle by delivering fresh pre-portioned ingredients to you guys so you guys have exactly what you guys need and helps you cut down on the food waste. That's great. It's awesome. You got to check out HelloFresh. It'll be linked in the top description. Plus, if you guys don't want, you guys can pro- uh, swap out some proteins and sides so you guys are liking. It just, they, they make it so easy for you guys. So right now, hey, if you guys are trying to save some money and you guys are to help out your honey to do list, check out HelloFresh. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and it's 25% cheaper than takeout. So why wouldn't you not want to give them a shot? It's, it's, it's so easy. If you guys are not a pro inside the kitchen, don't worry. They make foolproof recipes arriving, pre portioned, and easy to prepare in just a few steps. You guys, I'm telling you, check them out. They care about quality. That's why their seasonal ingredients are picked at peak ripeness and travel right from the farm to you guys' home in less than seven days so you guys know it's fresh. I love it. I got a busy life. My wife loves it because she's exceptionally busy. Delivers right to your door in a big, beautiful box. It's got this 
um, thick packaging on the inside, so it keeps everything cool. It's it's really great. You guys got to check them out right now. HelloFresh makes cooking easy, fast, and and you need to check them out. It makes it it makes it fun as well. You and if you and your your spouse are looking for something to do together, and you guys like to cook, hey, this will be your chance to to kind of bond, have a good time. So go to hellofresh.com forward slash speak the truth sixteen and use code speak the truth sixteen for sixteen free meals plus free shipping. It's that easy. Sixteen free meals, guys. 16, seriously. It'll be linked to the very top description. All you got to do is go to HelloFresh.com forward slash speak the truth 16 and use promo code speak the truth 16. All one word with two, just one and six at the very end. It's very easy. Very, very easy. Check them out. 16 free meals and free shipping. Oh my God. America's number one meal kit is coming right to your door and you guys get 16 of them for free by clicking the link in the very top description and use the code speak the truth 16 at checkout. Now, the latest attack on Ukrainian territory has cost the Russians. $120 million. Yes, that happened yesterday. The X-47 Dagger. That thing cost roughly 10 million dollars. They had six launches of those things. By the way, these all were shot down. $60 million. The Caliber cost like $6.5 million. They shot nine of those things, which was roughly almost $60 million. $58 million. Uh, there was another one called the Shahid. You guys know that one? It's like 20000 to 50000 or whatever it is. They shot six of those things. I think you're looking at about a quarter million dollars. The Orland 10, that's about, a, I think it's about a hundred grand. One of those is gone. This is, this is what's kind of crazy. So they, they're setting all this stuff in there. They also had a, they, there was another one, the Orland, by the way, they were about 300 grand. I don't know how they're getting all these numbers on these totals, but that's pretty much what they go. Now in general missiles themselves, um, that what, what was it? Two nights ago, it cost Russia $120 million. $120 million. Nothing came of it. Yes, there was some damage to a uh, Patriot missile system, but it wasn't actually to the launcher. It was to something else, and it didn't make it inoperable. It's still operating. And it did pretty well, because guess what? All $120 million of those rockets that were shot in that literally killed nobody and did nothing? Guess what? They're on the ground. So Russia's defense spending, by the way, has increased 282% year over year since last year. In just January and February, they've spent $26 billion on defense. If you guys want to talk about like, like how to kill a country without killing its people directly, well, I mean, I mean it's all ironically enough, this is pretty much what's been happening. $26 billion has been spent in two months alone. They have produced more tanks in 2023 than they did all of 2022 already which I guess is good for them because they have literally lost everything, but it might be a little bit too late here for that. I mean, it is it is pretty crazy. And I do believe the more I'm seeing this, the more I I, I think both sides are like, it's like we're a spring being wound up right now. And I think Willie's going to be coming at a great time because I think the offensive is going to kick off very soon. And it should like a, like, I mean like a big offensive, like a real one, like an end of war type offensive. I think that could be a thing that is happening. I could be incorrect. What they're doing right now, I think they're probing, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. I think they are probing. And I want to bounce back over to the topic we talked about earlier, the Wagner inside of Bachmann, just for a minute, okay? There's some footage out there I would like to actually share with you guys, which is actually from the Wagner inside of Bachmann. It came out here just a couple hours ago. I'll show you the absolute destruction of the city itself. ЧВК Wagner практически полностью зачистили район Гнездо, последнее укрепление ВСУ в Бахмуте. Из подвала выводят и эвакуируют мирных жителей. So all that footage has actually been geolocated. It's actually very accurate from what I could tell. The civilians you guys saw that are trying to stay alive or living right on the front line that is smashed between the Russians and the Ukrainians. Literally right there. Earlier in the video, there's actually some dead bodies that were all over the ground, some some Ukrainian ones, but I'm not going to show that. Clearly, that's like, not something that's going to happen. So, I mean, there's a smack dab in the middle. It's pretty wild if you guys think about it. I also think there's a chance that Pogrosian has decided to start transferring his men on the outer flanks with the Russian military in order to like save himself a little bit of humiliation. They're now currently blaming the Russian Defense Ministry right now for not supplying the needed UAVs to help their artillery units in, engage, which is kind of goofy. That just seems like their men are very poorly trained to me, and they're struggling to do their job with a drone. I get it. People, in, in the way the tactics change, but 
you should be able to get a grid coordinate and kind of dial it in to a certain extent and just send it. But the thing is, they're, they're not getting the kind of ammunition they need. You also got to think about barrel life length. You got to think about getting the rounds up there. It's it's actually somewhat comical. It, uh, it, I would hate to be a Russian right now, to be honest with you. It would suck. The more and more I'm actually reading into this thing, by the way, it seriously looks like Bogosian is starting to take his men off certain flanks preparing for this counteroffensive, like legitimately. If the Russian forces put their men there in these areas, they're clearly, they, they don't want to lose. They're going to they're gonna end up replacing them. These positions right now are not really to his favor. So he thinks like saving his own men is going to save his ego, which it is, because he then he can say he wasn't in control of these areas that then fell to the Ukrainians as they pushed through. Bergosian also did not want to send his men into these areas to gain a foothold, by the way. Um, they were talking about an operation that happened. They were attempting to gain a little bit of ground inside his area, but he didn't want to do it, pulled his men back, and the Russians' 4th Brigade actually went in there to attempt to, to, to gain a foothold, and they took significant losses and casualties and everything. Like, it was just really brutal. Nothing came of it. They just lost a lot of men and equipment. I think he's actually a fairly smart businessman as a whole. He deals in death. He's really good at, he knows that fear, good, good at, he knows that fear sells. He did really well at the beginning of this war, taking areas, building his name for himself. Everybody knows who the Wagner group is now. Everybody does. They want, they want to use them for wherever they can in South Africa. Countries will pay them for security. That's pretty much what it's for. Okay. I don't I mean he's going to do any business with any kind of NATO country, but you guys know what I mean? He sees this as an opportunity to pull his men back out of this area and have the Russians rotate in. Him see him feel like and him actually make it seem like, hey, look, I'm doing a really good thing here. I've done my job inside of this war. Now you guys can rotate your men in and I'll come back and I will wait. You know, it's either happening right now to force the Russian government to give him supplies. So that's another thing. He could be forcing them and doing this kind of stuff and playing like a game with them. Like, yo, if you guys want me to stay around and keep doing stuff, you guys you guys are gonna have to to, to give me what I need. And him playing this game ends up actually just having more Russian troops die, which they don't really care. He's just trying to prove his point. He is really thinking about leaving the area. That's another thing. What if he is thinking about leaving the area? What if he's like, you know what? I'm done here. I'm going to go off and, and do something else. I'm a businessman. Even though I, I live and die and breathe for, for death and war. That's me. That's what I like. That's him. You know, that's what he's saying. I don't know. Very strange little battle going on there, which we've never actually seen in any other war where... He's putting privatized military, it just doesn't really make too much sense. We use stuff like that inside of Iraq, but it's sort of like convoy missions and stuff like that, like keeping people safe. It wasn't for like, yo, let's go take this, let's go take Fallujah with Blackwater. That didn't happen. It's also confirmed, by the way, the Russians have actually been deploying more VDB inside of this area to pick up the slack from the Wagners, add them in rotating out. The focus is now shifting more, I guess, of a... a to like more of a defensive posture as they rotate these units in because the Ukrainians have been taking a little bit of ground on the outskirts of the city. Now, the Ukrainians do not seem to be taking back the city itself, but rather taking back some of the ground on the outskirts. With Yes, we have some mapping for once. Oh my God, what is what is going on in this world? Now, I personally do not feel like they've they've kicked off this, this, this whole offensive. Now, the area I'm talking about, they've taken it back, is a pocket right here and a chunk right here. Yes, they've gone on the offensive, and right now they are trying to push on these outskirts. Not super heavily. I think they're more or less bouncing around. Um, I don't think they're putting a lot of effort into here. I think they're just trying to hold this area right here, which is pretty smart because it has these main routes that lead out of it, which is pretty good. We know there's routes leading out that have been the entire time. But I think they're trying to find gaps okay, and report back to higher up so they can get a full picture of what is going on. This kind of reminds me of when I was in the military, a lot of the times like a, a lot of people don't realize a job as a sniper is not to go out and, and how, what's the best way to put it? A lot of people, they have this in the mindset because they've watched a lot of movies that a sniper goes out, sits on a rooftop, sees a target of opportunity, takes a shot, kills them, bounces. That's not, I mean, that is sometimes. We did go on those kind of missions where we'd go out and we'd actually, we had a job, we were, we were attempting to find a certain area or find what's going on. But a lot of the time we're watching. A lot of this kind of reminds me of that. We're watching a lot. You have recon elements that are going out and doing a job probing attacks. Like they go out, like the guy was talking about. They go out, um, um, recon by fire. You know, that's a thing. You go and you're trying to see how the your enemy is actually going to react to you shooting. Sometimes it does pan out pretty terribly and you take a round to the chest or you lose an eye or something like that. What was happening to him? But sometimes you, you find a lot of information about what's going on. So you can actually shift a, a front line and, and pretty significantly where you're going to actually think you're going to punch through. And the Ukrainians have done a fairly good job. That's probably why I think they haven't fully 
engage in this whole counteroffensive because they don't exactly know where they're, they're trying to go through. And that's why we see, we're seeing some more stuff down in the southern portion of the country as well. It's getting a little bit more, um, I'm not going to say interesting, but I, I feel like the Russians down there in that area are getting a little bit more tense. I don't think they really like what the position they're in right now, but they have had a tons and tons of time to actually build it up, which I don't know how that's going to pan out down there on the southern side. I'm talking about down north of Carmia. You guys know that whole Zaporizhia region. But right now outside of Bakhmut, I think they're just pitting them in certain side of pockets, trying to see where do they think they can actually get through. Because just south of there as well, which is the front line has not shifted a single bit north of uh, Avika since like the beginning of the war. Now we're going to enjoy ourselves a bit of peace from uh, Russian State TV because we have to have it. We absolutely love this guy. 30 лет они сказались наше общество совсем не то, что было советское общество в 41 году. У нас нет той идеологии, которая спаивала. Что бы там ни говорили, спаивала. Советская идеология была сильной. К 1941 году было воспитано поколение советских людей, которые были воспитаны на советском кино, на советской музыке, на советской литературе, у которых была четкая и жесткая идея, там, плохая, хорошая, неважно. Но она была. Во-вторых, Была Красная Армия, да, со своими большими проблемами, но если вы посмотрите, весь офицерский состав, включая высокие команды, это были молодые люди. Это, был, это, это были люди там 40-45 лет, по-моему, Жукову в 41 году было, может быть, меньше. No, I don't really want to be the bearer of bad news here. Anyone in their mid-40s, you aren't young. You're not young. I'm sorry, we all started dying after the age of 30. I think that's what it is, right? You might think you're young, but you ain't, you're not. Let's just be honest. The military, they want men in their 20s. They want a guy that's 18, 30. By the time I was, I was 30, though, I was pretty broke. I ain't going to lie. I'm 33 now, and I'm having to go see a doctor weekly to make sure I've, I can stand up and walk. Like my, my back's all jacked up. But that's actually from the military, jumping out of planes, doing stupid stuff like that. They want guys that are fresh at life. They have no fear at all, or at least they feel invincible. That's, that's, that's true. Men in their, in their early twenties is, <laughs> I always make this joke. Women, they, they, they mature in their lower twenties pretty, pretty rapidly. A woman that's 21 is about the equivalent of maturity level of a guy that's 35. <laughs> Let's just be real. That's why they live longer. They do, they don't do as stupid stuff as we, it's, it's good. They, I would, there's a lot of stuff I would probably reconsider some of the things I did during the war or both of them, mainly just the second time I went over to Afghanistan. I did a lot of stuff there. I, I mean, I would still do the same things, like in those situations, but I mean, I would attempt to find prob probably a different way to go about it because, my God, some of the stuff I did was somewhat stupid, kind of crazy. Uh, I don't know. I look at it. I look at the world just a little bit differently now. Maybe it's because I have a kid. I have another one on the way. I'm, I don't know. Mary, I don't know. It's just Maybe it's just a little bit different. Like, there's this time. I'll never forget what I actually was. Like, as stupid as this thing and I love, but it's kind of cool. Now, I have these kind of stories. That's why I always tell people, you got to join the military and do some, some some stuff if you can. Now, it's a little bit different. I guess um, my life wouldn't be the same if I didn't do this kind of stuff. But I kind of just remember, this is so stupid. I uh, I literally st stood up and we were like trying to draw fire so some of our guys could go. And then he was doing, he did burpees to draw some fire. Like, you were thinking about that kind of stuff. Like, like, why would my guy, a buddy of mine... To get a shot, so this is one of those kind of, I don't think I've told him, it's a bit of a story, a chunk of a story. He was also another sniper, and there was another SEAL with him, and they were pinned down. They had two Taliban going on the backside of a hill, and they were taking single shots, which, I mean, it's a sniper, some guy with a dragon off or something, and they were trying to find out where the guy was. So he legitimately does a burpees. You remember burpees? To, to, to have them engage him so then the other guy can see him and then kill him. And find out where the fire is. It's, it's like me being 35. I don't know. Like, would I want to do that now? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. In your mid-40s, your body just isn't the same either. You have no idea what they're, they're going to get in the mid-40s when it comes to... I, I don't know. What am I going to be like in my, my 40s? I have no idea. Anyway, long little tangent there, but... It was a different population. И наши сегодняшние за 30 лет, надо сказать, удалось, удалось создать поколение на американском кино, на, так сказать, на литературе, на массовой культуре. Ну, вообще, оно очень прозапно. 
Более того, даже среди патриотов, я смотрю, они все равно в этом, как говорится, как у нас любят говорить, западные тренды, ну, назовем направление, понимаете? Особенно, конечно, центральные города, Москва, Петербург. Я смотрю вот ваши репортажи, потрясающие. То, что вы делаете, это замечательно. Но я смотрю на лица людей, но меня не обманешь. Это ребята из провинции. Это работяги, как всегда. Это слесаря, шоферюги из, из, из дальних этих каких-то городков, сел. Это они вот вообще воюют. Это они, они, наверное, кино-то не видели, поэтому и американского никакого, может, и не видели, поскольку они за эти годы, к сожалению, это та часть населения, которая как бы относится к бедной части. Now, I'm not entirely sure where this conversation is heading, but there's, there's no different here in America. Okay, no different here in America. Most of the people in the military don't come from money. They don't live in a big city. I, I don't ever recall serving with anybody really from a major city. Most of the guys I knew grew up playing like in the woods. I grew up playing war in the woods, ironically enough. My sticks and my pine cones. I loved it. It was a lot of fun. Let's play war. I had 10 lives though. So it was different. It's also uh, very job dependent. I would assume most of the pe people in the military who are like paper pushers. The military has a lot of normal jobs. People don't realize that. I, I don't even know if the infantry or combat, like real combat arms jobs inside the military take up like 10% of it. Like a lot of people are like, yo, I'm in the army. Like, oh my God, you're really cool. Thank you. But you're like, well, I, I'm a dentist or I'm a dental hygienist or I, I, I'm a tax person. Like there's like shit. There's so many jobs in the military. You know, it's like whatever it is. Then they're not like a bunch of idiots like myself who aren't used to doing much of anything and they're used to picking up stuff and just putting, that's all I'm good for. We're from the rural areas. All those people that are doing those kind of jobs. Yeah, they're probably from the city опасности, но дело все в том, что э, опасность велика. Они действительно э, и, и отсюда ощущение все время, что мы опаздываем с какими-то решениями, с какими-то ответами, понимаете? Вот, вот мы, мы все время не ожидаем, мы не ожидаем, что им поставят ракеты в средней дальности. Они поставили уже их. А что такое ракет в средней дальности? Она до Крыма уже долетит. А что будет в Крыму, если там сезон начнется и начнут ракеты прилетать? Кто-нибудь об этом думал? Но мне кажется, что вот это вот осознание того, что это серьезнейшая схватка, серьезнее, действительно для нас судьбоносная, оно должно, прежде всего, наверное, и в какой-то политической элите со... Now, I would assume if missiles were flying into Crimea, there won't be very many people visiting there because the offensive may have made its way down there. And it's also, he's a bit right when saying the confrontation is very serious for the Russians. If they lose, they're back to hiding away, figuring out new partners. Do you want to work with them? Right now, they have China, which is what they kind of do. It's like a friend of me, which is an entirely different story for a different time, which we're not going to talk about right now. Because we have to recognize that this is not just a special military operation. It's really a war. Это война, причем война, в которой, если мы ее проиграем, то мы уйдем вместе за Шаенами, Дакотами, Каманчами и другими, как говорится, прекрасными племенами, которые просто растворились в небытие. Пощады не будет, это же видно. Посмотри на их, на их риторику. Для них это тоже война судьбоносная, и они к этому пришли. И они будут воевать до последнего. Могут довести до ядерной войны, не дай бог, не дай бог, но мы должны понимать, что мы, как говорится, сражаемся с беспощадным противником. There it is. They are going to change this thing over. Finally, they're going to change over to a war for them being, it's, it's been a war for over a year now. They're like, okay, it's time for us to look at this thing. It's a war. Great. Good. Я надеюсь, что они понимают, что если мы проиграем, то мы с собой заберем весь мир. Хочу напомнить фразу Верховного Главного Командовича, зачем такой мир, в котором нет России? Они... Сомневаются Понимаете. в этом, я, а это, мне кажется. Они в этом, они в этом да, сомневаются. мне кажется, они в этом сомневаются. Но это не значит, И, видимо, у них есть для этого какие-то основания, понимаешь? Не надо их оглуплять. Они, Нет. Они просчитывают этот вариант. Ядерное оружие надо продемонстрировать, надо выйти из договора, а, а, то есть снять с себя все эти ограничения по испытаниям, продемонстрировать, что есть, продемонстрировать, насколько убедительно, Владимир Вольфович Жириновский покойно предлагал для этого использовать одно из островных государств. Необитаемый остров. Необязательно необитаемый. А, если необязательно, тогда Шотландию жалко. Ну, 
Владимир Вольфович предлагал не Шотландию, но недалеко. Семен Аркадьевич не любит разговоры на эту тему. Он у нас не пацифист ни в коей мере, но ядерному оружию относится с тревогой. А я как-то по-стариковски... My God, this guy is absolutely... Ins he's insane. If he wasn't talking on TV about killing people daily, because that's all he does. He talks about nukes taking out these entire countries. I think you'd be seeing a Netflix series on this guy about in this, the, the, the serial killer. Like, what is this guy? Oh, he's always talking about... It's all he talks about. It's legit. It. How he wants to destroy the entire planet, take out the country. The, the world cannot live without Russia. We got to nuke him. We got to nuke him. We gotta, like, imagine eating dinner with this guy. It's got to be absolutely miserable. Еще два фактора, которые необходимо учитывать. Первое, что молодежи физически мало. Что если посмотреть демографические ямы, ну да. то вот этого слоя молодежи реально в России мало. Второй очень важный фактор – это физические кондиции людей моего возраста. Это точно. То есть сейчас 60-летние ну, примерно соответствует тем кондициям, которые во время, наверное, Великой Отечественной войны были у 40-летних, если да, не 35-летних. Да, да, да. То есть сейчас ребята на фронте, там, мои ровесники, чуть моложе, чуть старше, выполняют задачи, находятся в потрясающей физической форме. То есть могут, знают и умеют. Поэтому и вот эта еще оценка боеспособности тоже сдвинулась по возрасту, так повысилась. Ну, это, это просто как бы... Мои наблюдения. Детали, важные да, детали. Не, не да, претендую на да. истину в конечной инстанции то, что вижу. Now what in the world are we seeing him trying to, he's trying to rationalize something here. Having 60 to 70 year old men on the front is not how you're going to win a war. Those type of men to be holding back the rear, if they're even helping at all. Helping with supply. I could imagine, I'm in the military and all of a sudden my, my 65 year old grandpa who can barely even walk comes up wearing a full vest and helmet and is like, all right, I'm here. All right, well, you're actually going to, um, I love you. You're a great guy. Thank you for everything you've done in your past. But you're you're more of an issue for us up here because if you get injured, we got to carry your ass. Get Go back there. Go stand like 87 miles that way and just guard a gate. That, the other problem is that our younger generation isn't on board with the war. You wouldn't be seeing these kind of old men running around trying to take over another country. Like, my God, this guy is honestly just trying to come up with an excuse to make himself feel better about his, his country and what is going on. When you guys think, 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 seriously think about that. If you have older people, which is nothing wrong with them, everybody gets old, everybody dies. You don't want them on the front. What is this guy talking about? I get it. If you're trying to, to hold back a Nazi, a legit Nazi regime, which they did back in the 40s, sure. Everybody, every able-bodied male hit the front. Here's a rifle. We're stopping these son of a guns. Right now, Not even relatively close to the same thing. Now, one of the last things I want to discuss is the fact that I do believe the Ukrainians will end up getting some sort of F-16 help. I don't believe it's going to be soon. Maybe it will be when the war is over. I don't know. Maybe when it comes to first But maybe, just maybe, they're just playing a mind game with the Russians because it's actually working if that is the case. Запад окончательно сошел с ума. Мы с вами это хорошо понимаем. Все наши попытки с ним подружиться, играть на полушишечки, они ни к чему хорошему не приведут. А французы и британцы уже заявляют, что будут учить украинских летчиков. И при этом обратите внимание, как интересно. Они говорят, что они, не-не-не, самолеты мы не обсуждаем. Ну хватит дурак от включать. Ну ясно, что и Макрон и Сунок редкие скоты, но не должно быть никаких иллюзий, то что э, они дадут и самолеты, и все что угодно. А то есть, получается, они обучают пилотов, и те будут так бегать по земле и говорить, вжи 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 да Поэтому они участвуют. И то, что сказала Бербук, если страна поставляет оружие, она просто сказала России, то она является участником конфликта. Поэтому давно пора признавать Францию, Германию, Словакию, там, Британию, странами участниками конфликта США и наносить удары по их объектам. То есть просто по их объектам наносить удары, вот которые для нас представляют опасность, где производится западная техника, где идет обучение укронацистов, туда должны лететь кинжалы. Well, the thing is, they, if they're going to send these kinzels, they need to do it a different way they did the other day. Just because they didn't really make an impact. And no pun intended, because that would end up getting well, shot down like it did. In Africa, no one of France is going to be in the United States. Макрон, ну что такая истерика, что он говорит о потере России геополитического влияния? Потому что мы вышибли эту дешевку. Просто взяли его за нос, да и выкинули из Африки. Ну, не мы, конечно, музыканты сделали. 
Ну, молодцы. То есть, имеется в виду, не мы, не я, не Соловьев Лайф. Это блестящая работа оркестра. Молодцы. И вообще, повсюду, где они есть, их, они должны чувствовать, так у них земля должна под ногами гореть. У немцев, британцев, французов гореть должна земля под ногами. Американцев. Надо создавать проблемы им повсюду, всей их военной инфраструктуре. Я вообще не понимаю, почему существует до сих пор вот вся эта подводная инфраструктура. Они взорвали наши газопроводы, мы до сих пор ничем не ответили. Я не понимаю, почему мы так мягко себя ведем по отношению к полякам. Я реально этого не понимаю. При Балтам, то есть, почему вообще так себя ведем? Я считаю, что нам надо выйти из договоров о моратории на испытания ядерного оружия, провести, чтобы не было никаких иллюзий. Испытаний как тактического, так и стратегического ядерного оружия. И аккуратненько вытащить все со складов. And once again, he talks about the using nukes or getting out of some sort of tree so he can get back to testing. I don't think he realizes the more and more and more you talk about these things, the less and less people actually do fear what you're talking about or believe you. The U.S. has has, has, has really never said a word about or the fact that most of the, that we're the most powerful military on the planet. That's because everybody believes us. That's probably another reason why Russia is not able to carry out the things he's talking about because they're not capable of doing so. We got seven days, or four days, excuse me. Willie's going to be here. It's going to be really exciting times. I, I am excited. I do love you guys. Thanks for hanging out with me. I will catch you guys on another episode. I'm out.